So this was supposed to be part two of my what is science fiction video series and I wanted to use Star Wars as an example of what science fiction is not based on my theories. But in thinking about it, I figured Star Wars has a very special place and rather than go into the semantics of why it doesn't fit my definition, let's use this to highlight the pure aesthetic appeal and what Star Wars has done to open up the realm of possibilities for science fiction ever since Star Wars. No, it doesn't shed light on the human condition. No, there isn't much social commentary. I suppose, trust your instincts, don't bail on your friends. And then there's some pretty interesting things about power corrupting. But in the mo for the most part, I believe Star Wars represents a watershed moment in science fiction emerging on the mainstream. So to write off Star Wars as a work of pure escapism is to miss the point of what pure escapism provides in the context of science fiction. That Star Wars bears no correspondence with our ordinary reality, well, this is what makes Star Wars a watershed moment in science fiction history. Star Wars is itself an exercise in the pure, imaginative, and aesthetic potential of science fiction. The film is wholly immersed in sci-fi elements, but raises an interesting debate about what science fiction really means. In my own stuffy, overly academic definition of science fiction, Star Wars emerges as the quintessential example of token science fiction, but like Salvador Dali's surreal landscape cemented surrealism as an art form every bit as technically astute as realism, Star Wars' complete and utter detachment from our ordinary reality shows how the technical merit of sci-fi cinematography can be every bit as persuasive as realism. Because like Dali, Star Wars made the fabulous real. Nobody looks at Chewbacca and sees a guy in a monkey suit, and nobody looks at C-3PO and sees a guy in a robot costume. I guess they don't look at R2-D2 and see a midget in a trash can either, do they? Nobody looks at Dolly's melting clocks and sees a painting of melting clocks. They see what is it like for clocks to melt. Suspension of disbelief is of utmost importance, and it is never violated by, say, a guy in a pair of wayfarers or an alien in bell-bottom pants. To this day, Star Wars serves as an example of the power of practical special effects over computer-generated. In my definition of sci-fi video, I explain how Rule 1 mandates that some unknown, undiscovered, yet-to-be-invented, what I call fabulous element, be attributed to technology or biology, and not mythology or don't worry about it or simply not explained at all. So Star Wars puts itself on the cusp of this in the first five seconds of the movie. A long time ago in a galaxy far away. It is so removed enough from our own world, it might as well not even be our universe. But it is, technically, which sort of satisfies this first rule. Because it was a very long time ago, every last bit of technology has emerged out of non-human progress, and every last character is an extraterrestrial, even the human-like ones. But it is the second rule where Star Wars falls short. How are all these elements affecting the lives of the characters? First of all, the Force doesn't count because it's attributed to magic. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side. You don't believe in the Force, do you? Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful Force controlling everything. There's no mystical energy field that controls my destiny. It's all a lot of simple tricks and nonsense. I suggest you try it again, Luke. This time, let go your conscious self. Or, as Joseph Campbell explains, the Force is really just Buddhist samurai mojo in space. Well, he had him exercising with that strange weapon and then pulled the mask over. That's real Japanese stuff. Go through the rest of it. Han Solo is a smuggler, he flies a spaceship, but it might as well be a boat. It doesn't matter that they are aliens, and Greedo might as well just be some exotic smuggler foreigner guy. The Empire, Darth Vader, and the Death Star are all integral to the plot, but this might as well be the infiltration of some terrestrial citadel. The lightsabers might as well be swords, and the blasters might as well be guns. 
the trash compactor is just a trash compactor, and the alien that lives in it, the Dianoga, it is science fiction, but not all that meaningful to the plot, and could otherwise be a snake or something similar. Now, I would go further in suggesting that much of Star Wars' success at the time was that it didn't fulfill the second rule of science fiction. It did not ask its audience to return their thoughts to the political and social realities of its time. Aside from this one truism, made universal in Star Wars, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and the spirit of freedom and equality will fight to undo persecution and cruelty. This is a big issue, and sometimes it's the big, broad, seemingly facile themes that resonate most with our real-life political systems. But after Star Wars, and I would go further to say because of Star Wars, we begin to see mainstream movies adopt science fiction. And I'll admit, larger social and humanist commentary, and while softening the sci-fi elements with ordinary realist elements, these nonetheless ask audiences to ponder the impact of the sci-fi element on ordinary human life in our world. The spate of mainstream sci-fi that followed includes Mad Max, Tron, and the speculative war games. 1982's E.T., an extraterrestrial made familiar and sweet, still, E.T.'s alienness is admittedly significant to both Elliot and the plot. This is not token science fiction. You couldn't just replace E.T. with a talking bear. And by 1984, sci-fi fans had fully come mainstream. 1984's Starman just isn't about an eccentric, goofy boyfriend and his alienness. But his alienness is crucial to the plot. He can't be replaced with a simpleton. Even 1984's Splash is science fiction, because this movie really deals with the intricacies of having a mermaid as a girlfriend in a way that The Little Mermaid does not. Yes, mermaids are mythological, but in Splash, they are made scientific by being made plausible. 1984's Ghostbusters is another example of taking mythological elements, ghosts, and adding science, the containment facility and their little blasters, to the mix. 1985's Enemy Mine, where the alien creature just isn't some foreign enemy in alien clothes, but his alienness really affects his interaction with the protagonist and the outcome of the movie. The divide between aficionados of the Star Trek and Star Wars universes is one of hard science fiction, thoughtful social commentary, speculation on the future of human civilization, and one of pure, unadulterated escapism. In 1968, Star Trek set out to prove that science fiction could be used as a powerful tool for affecting progressive social change by highlighting the barbaric and discriminatory legacy of political systems in America and abroad, and a decade later Star Wars proved that science fiction can expand the imagination even broader. By bringing us to a time long ago in a galaxy far away, Star Wars paved the road for all future science fiction to embark upon a path that may one day bridge the gap between.